Well, and welcome to the round so far, brought to you by Amy. I'm Riley Beveridge. This is Kane Corns. Kane, it has been a dramatic weekend of footy so far. There was an absolute turn up for the ages at Optus Stadium. That's our big story. West Coast getting over the line against Frio. Hang on, West Coast are our big story. Oh, it's got to be the first time I've ever done this show, and a West Coast win leads the big story. These are the so- so- scenes after the final siren. What a performance! It was. I've been hard on West Coast, yep. but it's because I knew they were capable of so much more, and we're starting to see that. They are now relevant again through a young player who we'll get to in a moment, but not only him, some of their senior players. Yo wins the medal. Darling was mm. excellent, and then a lot of the others have come along for the ride. So two wins in a row for the Eagles. The high-scoring, powerful Eagles, yep. we're calling them tonight. <laughs> and, yeah, so we'll get to the fallout for Frio in a moment, but the positive was that West Coast are now playing the football we've known they've been capable of. First time they've won back-to-back games in almost three years. First time they've scored 100 points in back-to-back games since 2018 when they won the flag. But let's get to our Saturday star, and it is this man, Harley Reid, because once again he was sensational. The NAB Rising Star nominee last week. This week... He probably should have won the Glenn Denning Allen medal. You said that Elliot Yo won it, but he was superb. Yeah, I agree with that. He was quiet in the first quarter, and then just at the end of the first quarter, he kicked those two goals, and that absolutely got them going. So it was unbelievable. They just scored pretty much every time they went inside forward 50. Seven entries for five scores in the first quarter, and then he's doing this. So he's taken two absolute <laughs> screamers. He's gone forward and kicked three. We've known he's got this in the package, but he's improving every week that he's playing, and he's taking on the opposition tackle. He's bursting through. He's physical. It's a grown man. Like, he's played six games. What is that going to look like when he's 24, Mm. 25 years of age? And he has single-handedly changed the fortunes, I think, of the coach, Adam Simpson, and basically the whole of the club. The Harley hype is real. What about this man as well, Jake Waterman? Because he kicked six in that uh, drought-breaking victory over Richmond last week. Another five goals tonight. And he was the man that really helped them burst out of the blocks early. He's a nightmare matchup. And how strong are Frio's back six been? Uh, Ryan and Pierce have been enormous. And he's made them look foolish. So 11 goals in two weeks. He's turned into Tony Lockett. That's what we were saying during... <laughs> Uh, as we were watching the games tonight in an AFL house. And, yeah, what a performance it is. Had some health issues, had some injury concerns, mm. questions over whether he would actually ever play again. He's fit, he's healthy, he's hungry, and he's getting service like this. How often have we seen West Coast being able to deliver the ball to a forward like that? And they did that time and time again. And all of a sudden, for the Eagles, it's fun to be playing football again. It's not that fun to be watching Fremantle at the moment, though, because we mentioned their scoring problems last week. Only 40 entries tonight. Another score where they only kicked 68 points. They haven't got above 60s in the 60s for the last month. It's not looking good for them. They're lifeless, aren't they? Mm. They're they're lifeless now. They've been so strong defensively and sat here last week and said they're going to be in a lot of games because of how strong they are defensively. But when that falls away, what else do they have to go on? Because they can't score. So when they concede seven goals in the first seven of the game, you're going, well... That's about their average score. So Mm. actually to get even, they're going to have to kick seven and then to go ahead is very unlikely. So, yeah, they they were absolutely destroyed. Their defensive aspects fell away, but also their inability to generate entries. And Longmuir spoke about that last week. He said, we've got to score more. We've got to generate more opportunities. And against the worst side that we've seen in the last 20 years, they weren't able to do that. So they started the season strongly, but it's been all downhill since then. Let's get to Marvel Stadium now where Carlton recorded a really brave victory over the Giants. They were 22 points down in the third quarter. Then they kicked the next eight goals. Patrick Cripps and Sam Walsh leading the way. This is the win of the year for me. Like, I thought they were almost at breaking point with their injury list, which we'll get to in a moment. This is the third quarter where these two kicked five between them. We saw the midfield dominance, which we'll get to in a moment, but they would just smash them out of centre bounce. Kick six goals, five from centre bounce. The Blues to two goals. They really took it up to them there. You know, high up in clearances, not plus 18, I think it was, in, mm. in stoppage, giving these forwards some service. And both of them were well beaten early. Um, and, yeah, we're just seeing the ball movement, the speed, their high half forwards getting up, but it was their midfielders that did their damage. And I did love seeing that game from De Koning. So to get nine goals from Kurnow Mackay and De Koning and have yeah. Pitnet in the ruck, who was so good. Mm. If you're going to play two rucks... One of them has to be a capable forward, and he absolutely is a capable forward. But how about the numbers of the one-two punch in the midfield? Sam Walsh with his second game back and Patrick Cripps with his 13 clearances. 39 disposals and 13 clearances for Patrick Cripps. 35 disposals, 17 score involvements for Sam Walsh. 
these two changed the game. But as you mentioned, it was these two in the middle from the ruck in Mark Pitnett and Tom DeCone. Yeah. I know you've been vocal about whether or not they can play together, but they certainly showed up. Kieran Brooks was the third-ranked ruckman in the league uh, going into this game, but they got the better off. I love De Koning. I've always loved De Koning. There was one moment where De Koning flips it over the back of his head for a centre bounce clearance. Mm. He follows up, sprints forward and ends up kicking a goal from the top of the goal square. That is athleticism that he possesses and he he's now doing that around yeah. the... He's, he's like an extra midfoot. I, I loved his aggression throughout the final series last year. I thought he really came into his own. But the beauty of him, he's a very capable forward and yep. we've seen that. So, as I said... It's why Darcy and Jackson doesn't work at Fremantle because neither of them are a forward. It's why Draper um, and Goldstein doesn't work at Essendon, which we'll get to shortly, because neither of them is a forward. He's a genuine forward, and I think that's a real threat to be able to stretch the opposition key defenders, particularly when Taylor was out today. More frustration for Giants captain Toby Green. It hasn't been his season so far. He kicked five against the Gold Coast, but he's only kicked four from the other five games this year. Held goals for the second time in five games tonight, and then a moment late in the game, which he's probably going to earn match review scrutiny for involving Jordan Boyd, where he collects him high and late, jumping for the footy. Yeah, be frustrated yeah he'd be disappointed with this, I think. And you can see it. he's probably one of the most competitive players in the league. And everyone is now coming to him. 60 goals last year, All-Australian captain. And then you have a bit of a target on yourself. And everyone from the opposition comes hard and they're trying to niggle and get under his skin. And they've been successful at it. So here's the incident we're talking about. I think he's in trouble. Yeah. I think it's very similar to Peter Wright. I know the outcome was different where there is no concussion, but if we look at this angle, eyes off the ball, gets a vulnerable opponent in the head, yeah. and you've had a look at the, the matrix. What do you think it says? Yeah, I reckon it's probably careless, medium impact, high contact, which equals a one-game suspension. I reckon it gets upgraded because he does make contact to the head, so that's what probably takes it. Jordan Boyd played out the game, obviously, but I reckon that's what probably takes it to medium, which equals a one-match suspension. I reckon Jesse Hogan, who's the Coleman medal leader, is also in a bit of strife for this late incident involving Lewis Young, where he goes in twice. He only gets him once, but he gets him there high to the head, that's intentional, that's behind play. I reckon that's probably a one-match suspension as well, if it's intentional, low impact, one match for and to the head. They've got Brisbane it? next week on Anzac Day yeah. without Hogan and I, Green potentially. I know, and that was that was a big loss. They've still got some injury concerns as well. Canelio won't be back, mm. Taylor won't be back. No. If you lose two of their key forwards in yeah. terms of damage key forwards, then that could be a, a sway in the way of Brisbane next week. But that was just how dumb was that? From I'm not yeah. sure if the contact was enough to be a reportable offence. That'll be the meeting point. But to actually do that off the ball twice, and probably deserves a week. You mentioned the Giants injuries. What about Carlton's injuries? Because they won this game with 14 players unavailable. I reckon 11 of them would probably be in their strongest 23. And they went, had Zach Williams go down at halftime with an Achilles problem. So these are the 11 out of the side. A lot of soft tissue injuries. But with almost half of your best 22 missing, to then go out and beat a side that was unbeaten going into the game. And you, and you lose Williams today, who was yeah. doing a great job on Toby Green, and Boyd comes across and, mm. and fills the void. So it feels like they've got real depth. And there was always a brittle underbelly, I thought, about the Blues. Yeah. When they were challenged or when they lost a couple of key players out of the side, then they were exposed and they were vulnerable. Or when they were challenged like they were today throughout stages of the game, they were prone to capitulate. They're, mm. they're different side now. Um, and I just think the resilience that they have shown and that performance today with those outs that we've mentioned, that was probably, I said last week that Brisbane's win was the win of the season, but yeah. I think that Carlton win has overtaken it. That was enormous. And Jacob Wiedering is basically on one leg for the entire second half after a really nasty corky in the second term. Let's get to the Gabba now where Geelong kept its unbeaten streak alive in shocking conditions, rained all night in Brisbane. They beat the Lions, they thumped them in the last quarter, they kicked the final five goals of the match. Yeah, it's a really strange one because Brisbane plus 23 in contested, plus 24 in ground balls and plus six in entries. In those conditions, you go, well, you can't lose if you've got those numbers, but Geelong are just so smart. We're seeing a few discipline issues here. That was a 50-51 from Harris Andrews. The ball knocked out of Grind Myers and then that really gained the Cats some momentum. But as you said, Brisbane only kicked one goal after half time, so there's never going to be enough mm. to kick a winning score against a very good side, regardless of the conditions. But Geelong just played the conditions better. Yep, Brisbane won contest, strong in clearance, strong in ground ball, but the way Geelong were able to set up, protect the defence, and then score off it, they scored yep. five goals off turnover in those conditions. And how well set are they now? Mm. Undefeated, go to Brisbane and win. They've still got seven games at home to come. <laughs> Their ability to rest players, yep. so Tui doesn't play, managed. Stanley doesn't play, managed. They bring Dangerfield and Hawkins back. Conway gets an opportunity in Ruck. 
the way that he is manoeuvring a squad of probably 28 players, mm. he does it better than anyone. And right now, I just think they're absolutely in the box seat to make a significant run at another premiership, which is frightening. It's certainly, especially considering they dropped out of the eight entirely last year. It was Brisbane's lowest score since round four, 2018 as mm. well. So that goes to show how well they were held. A couple of concussion incidents in this game, which we mentioned before with Brisbane, but they've got some important games coming up. So Oscar McInerney goes down there, their big ruck. They had Josh Dunkley rucking for them for the majority of the game. This happened in the second term. And then Tom Stewart also went down with a concussion. Now Geelong plays a 5-1 and one Carlton next week. Brisbane plays a 5-1 and one GWS. Both of those players will be unavailable. Yeah, unfortunate. Nothing you can do about those. Mm. Both clubs managed it really well, straight off, assessed the vision and then ruled their players out. Yep. Um, and they miss a week, clearly. So big games next week without some key players, but uh, what about Brisbane's record at the Gabba yeah. this year? Because they were unstoppable that? there. Uh, absolutely unstoppable from 2020 to 2023. 42 and 5, undefeated there last year. Yeah. 0 and 3. Mm. Yeah, so, so that man, he looked worried on the bench. I'm not yeah. sure why he's coaching from the bench, but he was just sitting there instructionless, I thought, watching his body language from the bench. Get back up to the box, start making some moves. Yep. Uh, Fags, I thought, you know, he's clearly outcoached in those conditions again today. So they just need a bit more vibrancy about them, Brisbane. They've got all the tools, but mm. for whatever reason, it hasn't consistently come together. And then when you start losing at what has been a fortress for them, significant issues with this season slipping away. You would have never thought that after round six, Brisbane and West Coast would have won the exact same Amazing. amount of games. They're both two and four after round six. Let's get to the MCG now where Collingwood overcame a slow start to really do it their own way against, oh. against Port Adelaide. They walked in a number of goals, particularly after quarter time. It was just too easy for yeah, them. Yeah, so many twists and turns coming in this season, but this is one of them. I'm telling you, Collingwood are back. This yeah. was everything that we've seen about Collingwood winning a premiership. Port Adelaide unstoppable in the first quarter, got out to a 31-point lead, and then the Pies kicked 11 out of the next 12 goals, yeah. and it was built off that pressure. So there was two, three, four coming at Port Adelaide players, then their ability to go back and score. 72 points they kicked off turnover. I thought they were unselfish. Bobby Hill was, was unbelievable with how unselfish he was. And they had some key players down for a half. I thought, you know, Dacos nearing half time and touched the footy six times. Yeah. And his ability to work himself into the game ended up with 14 score involvements was unbelievable. But the best player on the ground was Will Hoskin Elliott. And mm. if he's played a better game than that, I certainly can't remember it. I thought he was awesome. Um, and, and he was the one that had a full four quarter performance from them. But they're back. We'll get to Will Hoskin Elliott shortly. Have a look at this, because this is the corresponding game last year. Now, Port went on to win, what, 12, 13, 14 games in a row after losing to the Pies at the MCG. But in almost every category, and contested footy is where the main area of difference is. They were plus 57 last year, the Pies, plus 41 today. Yeah. They just smashed They did, and ground balls as well last year was a real issue. It was yeah. a real issue for them again today. So there's a couple of things I was frustrated by with Port Adelaide. Two rucks doesn't work, as we said. Yeah. Unless one of your ruckmen can play <laughs> forward, don't play two rucks. So Jordan Sweet starts in the ruck. Soldo goes forward. Soldo's not a forward. Mm. He's had this unbelievable connection with Port Adelaide's midfield. They've been so strong, but he doesn't start in there with them. That, that's one point. The other one is I'm not sure why Port don't put their gun midfielders on ball at the same time. It's never Horn Francis, Butters and Rosie at the same time. Yeah. They try and be a bit cute. It's Wines in there or it's Mead or it's Drew. Put them all three in there at the same time, particularly when they were challenged mm. just before halftime. That was a frustration. And then, I mean, they can't escape their record against the good sides. They're very good against the middle to lower sides, Port Adelaide. When it comes to the best, particularly away from home, they get found out. And, yeah, that was a, that was a bit of a devastating blow in terms of their aspirations of where they thought they were at versus reality. When you said they kicked 11 of 12 goals, I thought that was the, the break glass point when they needed to get Horn Francis, Rosie and Butters in there together. Will Hoskin Elliott was the man, as you mentioned, that turned this game on its head right when uh, Collingwood was, what, 29, five goals down. So 29 points down in the second term. He had like a 10 minute patch where he just completely changed the game. Look at that, 21 touches, 13 of them led to scores, nine marks. And uh, he, t he turned into Jeremy Cameron for <laughs> a quarter and a half there. I just thought he was magnificent. He's sitting on heads, look at this. But if you're going to let him run um, a, a, a Lear a Lear, he's going to do that. And he's going to sit on your Ruckman's shoulders, which he did. But high up on the logo, thought his ball use was excellent. His ability to win one-on-ones, his aerial capacity there was, was unbelievable. And they just, to me, they look fitter. Uh, it's been one concern I've had about Port Adelaide. I thought Melbourne really outran them late in that game. And I just thought Collingwood were all over them and, and Port Adelaide unable to stop that momentum. Let's get to our Amy Clangers now. Who covers Clangers? Amy does. 
when we started the Adelaide Oval on Friday night, where Matty Nix, frustrating day, buzzing around on his head. Just the fly. Where's he the fly get rid of it. The entire game, he swatted at it a few times. Couldn't get rid of it. And how's this? A lizard. a lizard at the Gabba before the game tonight? There is a lizard at the Gabba. Look at the weather. I don't know, brought out, <laughs> brought out the lizard. So, yeah, a couple of funny moments involving animals this round. Well, Amy Clang is for good is back for 2024. Amy is donating $10 to community footy for every Clang up recorded over selected rounds with eight lucky local clubs across the season taking home up to $15,000. To put your club in the running, head to the URL on your screens now and tell us what the Clanger donation would mean for your local club. All right, we'll stay at the Adelaide Oval Friday night footy where we find our moment of the weekend now. It came in the dying seconds of Essendon's win over Adelaide. Kane, was it a free kick? Yeah, it probably was. And the <laughs> AFL have done a pretty good job to clarify that. I, we all know it was a strange thing for him to do. You've got to sense the moment, try and keep the ball in tight, in motion. Here's the reaction, here's the scenes. Terrific win from the Bombers. We'll get to how they did it in a moment, but here's the replay. He didn't I don't drag know what he it was in. Doing, though. He didn't drag it in. He just lied down on it, which was <laughs> strange. It was literally one second on the clock when the umpire made that non-call. And you can see the ecstasy and the heartache for Adelaide, who know that their season is now done. It is kaput. And Essendon at four and two have been really impressive. There's Taylor Walker. He says the umpire's a joke. So I wonder whether there's a please explain for Taylor Walker, not a good look. And I didn't mind this. Like, this is a bit... <laughs> this is, he's a character. Like, we want characters in the game. Final siren. He's celebrating with his teammates. How'd you do it? That's how I did it. So I don't think he should be criticised for that after the game. No, I didn't mind it. Essendon, though, you can talk about the one contentious moment as much as you like. Essendon deserved to win this game. They were 19 points down late in the third quarter. The, Essendon, the Crows kicked seven straight goals. They responded with five of the next seven. But really, they, they controlled the majority of this match. Yeah, double the entries at half-time. So it sh should have been all over. The ball was living in Essendon's forward half. And Adelaide could not get it out. There was no method whatsoever with Adelaide exiting the ball out of D50. I thought Essendon's pressure was excellent. I thought they were really aggressive with their ball movement. So that example there, straight down the corridor, they, they did that a number of times. There's Martin kicking a really important goal. I thought he was excellent. More so not high up in the disposals that he's had. He had 28, more damaging with his disposals. But they were resilient because they were challenged. I thought Dawson and Saligo for the Crows really got them yep. back into the game. And Rankin started to get involved in the second half after being quiet. So for their key players to, to really stand up again. I thought Caldwell and Durham's defensive pressure, nine mm. tackles each, was enormous. So they'd be thrilled with that. That's a big win against what we thought was a good side coming in away from home. And, um, yeah, they'd be pretty impressed with where they sit. We know Josh Rochelle is going to be a fantastic player. He's a fantastic young player. But a couple of moments late in this game, he's probably going to want to have back. Yeah, no doubt. You just have to take that easy, uncontested mark and clearly... He was expecting contact, and then this one here is, is exactly the same. Now, he could have been the hero for them. It's interesting the way that coaches will now handle that. No, yeah. So once upon a time, that we'd almost be humiliated in front of the group mm -hmm. um, for that and, and showing the vision that way. That's not the way it works now because that's not going to get the best out of your players. So it, it'll be a quiet word with Joshua Shelley. Look, to play in, that so in our side, um, those efforts aren't good enough and we need better from you. And I just wonder whether Adelaide have allowed um, him to just get a touch ahead of himself. Look, they're really happy for him to be a character. The Rocky celebrations after the goal in the face of the opposition, that's all well and good. And, and we like that. And as I said with Draper, we, we want the characters. But if you're going to do that, there's a responsibility to do the other stuff and the most important stuff and stand up when the game's on the line. He also blazed away with one inside 50, not for the first time this year. So, yeah, that will be highlighted, I think, individually with him um, and something that uh, he'll need to, to, to tidy up. Plenty of positives for Essendon. They're 4-2 on the season now. But you want to talk about their ruck situation because we know that Sam, Dra uh, Sam Draper missed round one with injury. But since Todd Goldstein and him have played together, Goldie's probably been the more influential yeah, of the two. This, this fascinates me. So 15 centre-bounce attendances for Goldie on Friday night, 10 for Draper. And Peter Wright's coming back. Yeah. So one of these two is going to have to miss... And I think, as you can see here with the hit-outs to advantage and his hit-outs in general, the Essendon midfielders prefer Todd Goldstein mm. in ruck, which is really interesting because I thought this guy was going to carry the ruck division for the next six, seven years, and they would have expected him to be that. He was the backup, but it's been flipped. So he started in there. He's always in there at the critical moments, and clearly the Essendon midfielders prefer 
Goldie's ruck work. So I think they're going to have to make a really difficult call, and that's what good sides do, and leave out Draper for Peter Wright coming back this week. It's going to be a fascinating selection decision for Brad Scott. All right, let's head to Thursday night footy at Marvel Stadium, where it was another upset. The Western Bulldogs absolutely thrashing St Kilda. And Aaron Norton was the man that led the way, despite Dogs fans calling throughout the week for him to be moved into the back line. Kicked six goals. Yeah, they, they smashed them, didn't they? All, all across all the numbers, plus 75 in disposals, 22 in tackles, 10 more inside 50s. Um, and then it was Waitman and Norton right from the start who just piled it on. Uh, and we're seeing the work of Bailey Dale as well, like him back in the side. This is career best game after being left out of the best 22 and sub last week so he he was just seeing his work rate here Riley which was a highlight yeah. now some would say it was a circuit breaker for him to go back and sub I would say it's amazing what happens when you play your good players and you yeah. give them some belief and you put them in the roles that you know they are good at so can't wait for Caleb Daniel to get back in the side because he's far too good not to be playing Jack McRae back in he had 12 score involvements Bailey Dale was influential play your good players and play them in the position that they are best at and it's amazing the results that you'll get. So hopefully the Western Bulldogs as a coaching staff have worked out something that's been pretty obvious to everyone else. Yeah, the sub last week, Bailey Dale, an All-Australian in the past as well. Now St Kilda's got a few issues at the moment, another defeat for them. I want to talk about their threshold in terms of what opposition sides need to do to score against them to win. So when they concede fewer than 70 points under Ross Lyon, they're 10-0. Mm. When they concede more than 70 points, they're 5-15. and 15. I reckon personally... 70 points is too low of a threshold. 100%. You, you can't be losing games the minute a side scores over 70 points. Each. As soon as you basically kick 11 goals, you win yeah. against St Kilda. So there's the method for it. And that those, those numbers are pretty damning. Yep, they've been good defensively. But like on Thursday night, if you have an outlier to that, similar to what Fremantle happened to them tonight, then you're in real trouble because yeah. they struggle to score themselves. And they're just in no man's land. The Saints, I, I keep saying this, I... I I don't know, there's, there's not much to get excited mm. about with the Saints, so I can't really find a positive for them. Maybe Wangane Miller, but he was really good last year. Philip, who hasn't probably come on as they thought, and Owens has probably been down. Apart from that, what has there been for them to get excited about? So, yeah, that, they'd, be, they'd be really disappointed with where they sit in the big game against Port Adelaide, uh, who were poor today on uh, Friday night coming up. All right, let's have a look ahead to the rest of the round now. It starts at the SCG on Sunday with Sydney taking on Gold Coast and then Sunday twilight at Marvel Stadium, North Melbourne against Hawthorne. A battle of the winless sides yeah. there. Be a couple of interesting games though. We've, we've had some poor games on Sundays. That first one is an absolute cracker because mm. I think two of the best midfields going at it. I, I'd ask you to split the midfields, but I think it's a really difficult question yeah. of who's got the better midfield with Heaney, the way he's going, Warner, um, you know, Rowbottom and the like versus you know, Rao and, and Anderson and Miller and yep. Flanders and, and these types of players. All right, let's get to our Canes questions now. Finn wants to know what area will Hawthorne need to improve to beat North Melbourne on Sunday? Midfield, midfield, midfield. Yep. They have been smashed in the midfield and I'm looking at one player. John Newcomb, you are enormous last yeah. year, All-Australian squad. There's been a drop-off there, so he's got to be the one to get them going because North midfield has also been poor, but they've got a lot of talent through there. So that's going to be the deciding factor in the game. Sam Mitchell keeps going on about the ruck rule change has really affected the Hawks. I don't want to hear that. Just give us a contest and get your best players with the footy in their hands. And Platinum Pete, one word answer. Do the Suns play Lacocious forward or back? Back. Apparently they've made that call. What I are you would, doing? I'd play him forward. 39 goals last year. Yeah. I, I spoke about him in the All-Australian meetings. Like this is, he kicked multiple goals many times. Kicked mm. five a couple of times. And I thought he's finally found his position as the third tall, but other younger ones have gone past him, and Damien Harwick clearly likes his ball use off halfback. Kane, loved your work tonight. Footy starts on Wednesday next week for the Anzac round, and we'll see you on Saturday night.